this is going to be uh, a bit of a, hopefully it won't be too long a presentation, but it's about a long story. I'm hopefully cutting a wee bit of a long story short. I retired about seven or eight years ago, and just before I retired, I bought one of these cheap Chinese CNCs. We'll talk about what I did and what I've been doing over the past nearly a decade with it. And then Jim has been using one over the past 12 months and uh, basically doing a, a much shorter learning curve. So hopefully we'll be able to see from his experience what it would be more likely to involve, be involved if you decide to do this yourself. So that's what I bought, <clears throat> a thing called a 3040. This, I went away and found a, a recent price for it. I paid about £350 for mine. One of the reasons that I bought it was I was thinking, well, I'm going to be retiring. I could make a wee, a wee side hustle by going to tattoo parlours and stuff like that and offering to engrave iPhones and laptops and whatever. You know, if you want to put your team's colours on the back of your iPhone or the back of your laptop, I could do that. But having spent some time on it, I realised that one, the ability to make a huge mistake and damage something is quite real. And it's really quite a complex business. And two, I'm too, life's too short and brutal and I'm too old and fat in the ass to be doing that. So I decided against it, but that was the original plan. The machine that I bought has, if you look, you can see the spindle there. Above the spindle, that black shiny thing is a fan, an extractor fan. That's on the Z axis. The Z axis has got an Acme screw with T nuts on it. So it's quite an accurate Z axis. Some of them are just servos. And if you look to the, the right of that again, you'll see that the actual material that it's built out of is all 12 millimeter aluminium section. So it weighs a ton. This thing came in a wooden box on a pallet. Try explaining that one to your wife when they appear at the door with it. The spindle has got a standard, it's a 53, 52 millimeter diameter spindle. It's exactly the same as a handheld router. If you've got a wee handheld router that plugs into a, a plunge router base, it'll do that. And the collar will take quarter inch, standard quarter inch uh, router drives or the eighth part a professional drives that you use for making printed circuit boards, which is what I really bought it for. I'll even go down and take Dremel bits via Dremel routers if you want to make it do that. It's powered by this thing. This is itself quite a big box. It's the size of a, a shoe box. It's got mains power on and off, spindle power on and off, speed control and an emergency stop on the front panel. On the back panel, you'll see a fan, five channels. There's four X, Y, Z, and A axes that are driven by stepper motors. And then there's a spindle, which is driven by PWM. And there's also another wee port on there, which is a five volt probe port for testing, for seeing if it's touching something. I'll mention that later on. And then below it, there's a 25 pin D type. And that 25 pin D type is how you're supposed to drive this thing. There's the 25 pin D type. It's designed to fit into a parallel pin printer port on a PC. Now, I'm looking round about me at the participants, I know that there's nobody here old enough to remember what a parallel printer port on a PC was. But up until the late part of the previous century, you get this big 25 pin port in the back of your PC and you could use that to drive a really old fashioned printer that involved Carpathian monks with, with pens and stuff, right? And they don't, they don't exist anymore. The supplied software is the software to drive a parallel printer port. It was called Mach. Three. It was from 1980, and they send you the Chinese language version. All those buttons are in Chinese. All the menus are in Chinese. There's no menu option for changing the language. And it's already licensed to somebody in China. So it's dodgy as 
dodgy is a dodgy thing is dodgy bits. So that's that. So initial initial issues with this machine. It only does a hundred mils up and down the way. That software is just junk. The parallel printer port works, but who's got a parallel printer port? It also doesn't have limit switches. If you take it beyond where it can go to the left or right or the front or back, it just hits the physical stop. It hits the, the end of the screw and makes a loud noise. The count keeps going and all that good stuff. But by that time, your, your, your print is dead anyway because you've went somewhere that you shouldn't have went. So for that reason, limit switches aren't really an issue. I've never felt the need for them. I only ever worked within a small area in the middle of the bed. And so limit switches, there isn't any, but it doesn't really matter. Of more concern is the fourth axis being an A axis instead of a, an E axis. You can buy a fourth axis for it. It's a stepper motor driving a, a chuck for engraving glasses or engraving shot glasses or engraving round things. But I have no need for that, so I didn't uh, spend any money for it. While I'm talking about the stepper motors, the stepper motors on mine are NEMA 23 standard. If you follow your uh, National Electromechanical Standards, NEMA 23 standard stepper motors are about 56 millimetres square. They're big chunky boys, whereas the standard ones tend to be NEMA 17s that are a little bit smaller, they're about 42 mil. And those tend to be the ones, if you've got a 3D printer, it'll be NEMA 17s that are on it. This is just a wee size up from that. Sorry to interrupt, can I just ask what exactly you mean by a fourth axis? Fourth axis, well I've, I've got X, Y and Z that I can move, X, Y and Z moves the, the head of the thing. I can then have a fourth axis that I, I can make move or rotate. Okay. So the, the fourth axis as supplied is this round thing for putting a glass on and the thing will actually draw in the glass as the glass turns. But on a, a 3D printer, the fourth axis is the extruder. So you, you send things to the E-axis and that pushes more plastic through. Lovely. So for Thank example, you very much. if I replace that A-axis with an E-axis, this thing will become a 3D printer quite comfortably. Lovely. Thank you. Right. No worries. If you've got a, a question like that, please don't hesitate to, to jump in. It's not a problem. So initially I had a computer with a printer port on it and I tried Mac 3 and it was rubbish. So I bought... I didn't buy, I acquired, I nearly said the bad word there, I acquired a soft a copy of the, Jet, the, the Mach 3 software with an English language interface on it, and it was still rubbish. Uh, part of the problem is that the later printer ports have big buffers on them, and so when you start sending stuff, the printer port waits until it's got a bunch of stuff and then sends it, and it does its own individual handshaking with the printer. And that was changing the, the timing of when the pulses were getting to the machine. And so the machine was printing garbage because it was using the printer port. However, I came across this thing, which Americans call garble, but Britons call gerbil, for reasons that are uh, entirely to do with the culture in the two countries. And basically it's a... <clears throat> an Arduino-based motion control system. System's a big word. You take yourself a standard Arduino, and as you know, when you plug your Arduino in, it becomes COM10 or COM11 or COM17 or something. So you've now got a COM port. And what you do is you send RS232 serial data to that COM port, and that'll output, this'll convert it from COM commands with text to motion on each of the channels to make the machine work. And there's a ton of open source support for, for this, which we'll mention as we go through. There's what it looks like. There's an Arduino Uno. And there's a bit of error board with some pins soldered to it. And it shows you how so hot a solderer I am that I can solder pins to the error board side, to the copper side. Try doing that. It'll smell like chicken. 
on the board, there's also a 25-pin D-type plug. And you can see a couple of wires snaking off to the right. Those are for a probe. Basically, my probe is a crock clip and a pogo pin. And when they touch together, that's the machine knows it's touched something. You can buy that a printed circuit board version of that for about £3. But basically, you can see a bit of error board and a 25-pin plug was all I needed. If I turn it over, there's the wires connected on the top. The wires from the output on the UNO. Uh, zero and one are for communication, so you don't use those. But two, three, four, five, six, seven become x-axis step, x-axis direction, y-axis step, y-axis direction, yada, yada, and yada. You clip them together, you get that arrangement. USB cable comes in to this, and then the parallel printer port just goes to a printer, a parallel cable that goes back to that black control box. I've also included on that uh, slide a picture of an Arduino Nano on a short cable. And the reason that I've included that is because that Arduino Nano has got gerbil on it as well. And that means that I can sit at the fireside with a glass of something warming and that plugged into a laptop and write code for this machine without ever having to go into the cold shed where it lives. Because it's noisy and makes a lot of stir, it's not allowed in the house. I'm only allowed in the house myself on certain occasions. This is certainly not getting in the house. And so I have to go to it. And if I'm going to have to go to it, I'm going to have to go to it with my stuff ready. So I can sit and prepare just using an Arduino Nano hanging out the side of my my laptop and I can write code against it there. And there's one of the standard programs that you use for it. Up here's the connection up to the top left. You see the connection to the machine, whether there's a connection, it's a gerbil connection as opposed to an HP, HG, HPGL connection or whatever, what port it's on, what speed it's at, and all that stuff. And below it, you've got jog controls for making it go up, down, left, right. And then over in the main window there, you can see a, a visualization of what the G code's going to do. So you can write your G code, you can do all this good stuff connected to the machine without being anywhere near the machine because of that wee nano hanging out the side. That actual model that's in there, if you look at the top, it says not Davy 2 G code. This was one of the early prototypes for the Easy Bus switch mod, not the switch mod, uh, the switch module. No, it's the output module. It's a, an early prototype for the output module where you we were working, building a prototype before we sent off for printed circuits to prove that the, the electronics would work. And that's why I use this. It's a cheap, easy way of getting an instant printed circuit board. Now, after a wee while of doing that, I discovered a new toy, which is this. And again, I paid about half of that for that because I bought it about five or six years ago. This is a little box that's about six inches by three inches, maybe. It's got a little TFT screen on it. And it's got all the jog controls. It plugs into the parallel port at the back of the machine. So I can just push and move the machine up, down, left, right, home it, center it, do all that happy stuff. But if you look where it says G and F on the, the keypad, next to it there's a wee penny slot. And in that wee penny slot, you put an SD card, a micro SD card actually. And once you put the micro SD card in, you can just pick the name of the file and press the button. There's a play button at the bottom and it will send your G code to the machine. So you can do all the prep work, as I say, next to the fire with a laptop and the dog giving you hassle and all that stuff. And then when you go out to the shed, you put the little SD card in, press the go button and away it goes. At the start, of the lockdown. I was thinking, well, if I'm locked down, I'm going to have some sport, I'm going to spend some time. And I bought one of these. 
The one I bought was a version 1.3. Since then, the version 1.4 has got radio, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and all that stuff. I don't need Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or stuff like that. I have enough trouble with electricity. It's got four stepper drives on it. It's got, uh, it's designed to drive a professional 3D printer. It's got its own control panel. It's got the whole nine yards. You can get the one, the simpler one, for about 30 quid or less. And I bought that thinking, I'm going to use that to replace that control box, that big steel box with the, the 10 amp transformer in it. But having played with that for a couple of weeks, about a year ago, I decided, no, that would be a waste. I could make a really good big 3D printer out of that. So it's in the box of junk for making the great big 3D printer. And the plan is that when I do make the great big 3D printer, I don't tell Davy Dick about it. Because he'll have me making, or who do you call him, an ace? Because he'll have me making great big bloody trains and superstructures for boats and stuff and if I've got a great big 3D printer they too aren't getting to hear about it so it's a secret between you and me but for that reason that's not in my system yet but it might be okay what can I do with this I can engrave engraving is where you make a small mark in one level with a pointed tool yep there's smashing engraving software out there for nothing. You can take a mouse, for example, capture the shape of the mouse on the machine, and it'll then engrave uh, a logo on the back of the mouse, for example. Yep. Most of what I do is making printed circuit boards on it, and that's technically engraving, although it's sometimes milling. Milling is when you cut material by repeated basically using a drill and moving it sideways or using a router and moving it sideways, usually with a flat tipped tool. Now you can buy milling tools and engraving tools for China and they cost four pound for a dozen. Or you can buy really good solid carbide tools from America at 25 pounds a pop. And all it takes is one cough in your G-code and it goes straight through the base of your machine and you never see the, the end of the tool again. So for that reason, I tend to be using the lots and lots of cheap Chinese cutters. A, a Chinese uh, cutter will last me for months, maybe a couple of months, and then you think that must be getting tired. So you take it out and replace it. It'll also take a laser and I'll show you a laser in a wee while. And it'll also take a pen and if you have been reading the 3D prints in a month, you'll know about me putting a pen on it because it was a 3D print of the month uh, about six months ago. And if you're not reading 3D prints in a month, you need to put your name up on the chat so I can send the boys round because you should be reading 3D prints in a month every month. It could do 3D printing. However, it only lifts four inches, so you could make prints up to a grand total of about four inches thick. So it'd be up to 24 inches wide, up to 18 inches deep, but only four inches wide, four inches high. So I don't know if there's a use for that, particularly when I've already got 3D printers, so I don't really need this to be another 3D printer. And there's no hotbed on it. I'd have to build or make some sort of great big a hotbed for it. There are people using it with a hot wire cutter to cut foam. Now you could make beautiful scenery in this if you could work out how to do the uh, the G code for it, because it'll do. When you say two foot, quite comfortably by eighteen inches wide, you can make a piece of scenery out of polystyrene foam if you could work out a toolpath for it. There are people doing that for making aerofoil sections for building radio controlled gliders, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There's a whole so, sorry, industry. Sorry, so there's a CNC output from a CAD program be able to give you the, the, the code for that? Yes. It'll, uh, there's, I'll show you software in a minute. This runs on pure G-code, the standard G-code that every milling machine, a uh, lathe, um, multi-head, every machine and industry uses, this uses standard G-code. 
You can make it move a camera. You can make it do photogrammetry. You can make a contact scanner whereby you simply send a, a point down until it touches something over and over again. And that way you resolve the shape of something as a whole series of points. There's all sorts of uses for this toy, which I'll now kind of drive on to. There's the setup. To my right, the left of me, as you look at it, you see the box. And on top of the box is that little controller that I bought. On top of the little controller, you'll, think you'll see something else. That's a micro SD card to SD card adapter. You know how we've all got a handful of these SD card to micro SD card adapters? So that you can put a micro SD card into an SD card slot. This is the opposite. It lets me put an SD card into that micro SD card slot. The reason for that is that when you start sweeping up or sucking up stour, when this thing's going, you're liable to lose SD cards. I don't know why, but when I'm using the Hoover, uh, micro SD cards disappear. SD cards, not so much. So for that reason, I tend to favour SD cards. Also, my laptop has got an SD card slot on it. So using the SD cards is better, and that's why I use that wee adapter. If you look at the machine itself, you can see the spindle. Above the spindle, you can see the Z-axis. You can see it's built like a tank. There's bits of printed circuit board lying about. If you look over the back of the machine, there's a really crap multimeter that I'm not going to talk about. There's lots of books full of notes and scribbles and things taken to myself. Did you know that the, uh, the copper on a standard FRG printed circuit board is not 0.76 millimetres thick. No, neither did I, but I do now because it's in one of those books. And then over to the, the right of that, you'll see a lot of carpet fitters tape. To make printed circuit boards on this, what I do is I take a piece of the carpet fitters tape, which is double-sided, broad, sticky tape. You get it from Screwfix, a three pound a roll. It sticks to the back of the board, and then the board sticks to the sacrificial MDF. And it's a fairly, it goes fairly flat. Maybe not flat enough, but I'll explain how I'm doing that in a wee minute. The shape of that big heat sink on the front and the bolts on it let you clap on other things. All you need is room to connect a couple of big M8 bolts. So that there's an extractor, for example. You can see the flexible hose that goes off over to the, the Hoover, right? The Hoover has now got a, a pair of ladies' tights across the main input nozzle or a micro SD card detector, as I tend to prefer to refer to it as. But we'll not, we'll not get into the, the exact details of how I'm doing everything that I'm doing. And then it is working. Kicks up a bit of stir, a bit of uh, dust for our friends from south of the border that don't know what stir is, but that's stir there. And that's what comes out of it. <clears throat> now that is uh, an adapter board for a TQF48, isn't it? It's behind my head there. It's a TQF44 adapter. And it's about the fifth the size of an Arduino, you know, board. So if I was going to send to GLC PCB or some of the Seed Studio or some of the standard houses for that board, it would take about a fortnight. And in order to get them, I would have to order, you have to order, what is it, 20 uh, Uno-sized boards. So I'd have to order 100 of those. I need one of them. And I'd have 99 of them to give away or sell or find a place for or whatever. So that's the reason that I use this. I get a, a result that is acceptable to my standards of working. It's very, very quick. And I don't need to buy stuff that I don't need to use. I'm not wasting a lot of board. I'm not wasting a lot of time. And I'm not wasting a lot of chemicals. Lasers. <clears throat> now, I have to say... And I will say it with hand on heart that this laser scares the cheese out of me. This is a five watt laser. 
And when you switch it on, it burns everything that it touches. I tend to use it at somewhere between three and five percent. It's a pulse width modulated thing. And I use it with a PWM that's about three to five percent. If I take it up, I had it, I was modeling it, I was working with it here on my bench. And this bright blue light came out. I had the, the goggles on, so I couldn't see how bright and blue this light was. I picked it up and did that to look round about, and it burnt everything it touched. It burnt screens, it burnt bits of metal, everything in the room got a mark on it for me swinging this thing about. It's like a laser cannon. It's like a, what do you call it? A, what do you call those things in Star Wars? The lightsaber, one of those. Bloody frightening thing. It cost me about 35, 40 pounds because I bought it a couple of years ago. What came looked exactly like that. The goggles are rubbish. So I went away and bought myself a pair of proper safety goggles because I trusted them, not those cheap Chinese gift goggles, which I really don't trust as far as I can throw them. When I plugged that 12 volt supply in to the wall, it went bang quite spectacularly. Without anything connected to the output, just plugging it into the wall made it go bang. So I picked it up and put it straight in the bin. I took it back out of the bin quite an hour later to cut the plug off it, the, the supply plug for supplying the board, because I suddenly realised it was a, a two and a half millimetre female plug on about a wire and I could steal that. The little controller board is really quite clever. When I switched that one on, it didn't work. It was a piece of junk as well. But by this time, I've blown up their supply. I've cut it to bits. I can't send it back. I'm stuffed. So what I did was I started and worked out how to build one of these things, a five watt laser controller. And by the time I'd done that, I'd also worked out what was wrong with that five watt laser controller. So I've managed to fix that one. So I've now got two of these. If anybody needs a five watt laser controller, give me a shout. I've got a couple of them lying about. The laser itself, at the top of it, you'll see a fan, a little 12 volt fan. The laser module isn't much bigger than the laser modules that we use for laser totties. And they're only one, three or five milliwatts. This is 5,000 milliwatts, but it's basically the same thing with a little brass container. It's pressed into a big black heat sink. And then at the end there, below the heat sink, is a focusing ring. You know how lasers, the light that comes out is collimated and it travels in parallel and yada yada. Well, it doesn't in this. You have to focus it. There's a little glass focusing ring that you have to twiddle to focus the beam. So what you then have to do is focus the beam at maybe 50 millimetres and then make your G-code be such that the laser flies at 50 millimetres. And if you cut the top layer and then go down a half a millimetre and cut again and down a half a millimetre and cut again, you can do multiple passes into the material by taking the focus point of the laser down in to where you want the cutting to happen. There's a laser mounted on the beast. As I say, the 3D printer is really, really handy for this. A 3D print these mounts. That white board there with all the holes in it is an extending cable to let me extend where the laser is relative to the board. When you use the laser, it's quite fascinating. The, I have discovered through playing with it that what makes something laserable are not laserable isn't the material, it's the colour of the material. And even the colours aren't intuitive. We've, we found this we working with one of the big K20 ones that a member had. Balsa wood, for example, wouldn't cut, but MDF would. Right? I found that if I tried to cut acrylic plastic, if I cut dark blue acrylic plastic or black acrylic plastic, it cuts straight through it, no bother at all. If I try to cut clear acrylic plastic or yellow acrylic plastic, the light goes through it. Clear acrylic plastic is by definition transparent, which means light goes through it. So what happens is it goes straight through and burns the board underneath, but the plastic remains untouched 
by having the laser go through it. So using the laser like that is a as a skill. Now that's something that I kind of wanted to say about the whole the whole ethos of this. I've been a couple of years playing with this on and off. And it's not an event. You're not going to buy one of these, bolt it together and start putting stuff out tomorrow or this week. You're going to spend a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, learning how the software works and how the files work and how the machine works and how the various uh, cutting ends work and uh, what materials react with what materials and what feed rates are good and what materials are best at what feed rates and when you have to cool it and how you can cool it and there's lots and lots and lots of variables it's like learning 3d printing it's a lot of guddling now i've been through that and you've all got my email and my address so you can give me a shout if you want to do this if you want some advice if you want some experience i'm more than happy to help there it's cutting that's a laser doing its thing. And that's uh, a box that Amazon sent me something nice in. Corrugated cardboard, straight through it, single cut. Now that's cutting what's called a vector cut, whereby the head, the laser head moves where you want the lines to be, if you see what I mean. The laser's running like a pen would. So it goes to the the starboard wing of that aircraft and starts, the laser comes on and then the laser runs in a diagonal down over the leading edge of the starboard wing, across the cockpit glass and then out along the port wing till it reaches the port wing tip. Then it goes along the, the shedding part of the port wing tip and then back along the trailing edge of the wing. As opposed to that, which is the same drawing done in raster mode. In raster mode, it's like a television picture. The, ca the, the camera, the, the laser scans from left to right and it gives, comes on and blasts where it wants her to be black. And then it scans back and comes on a millimetre down, blasting where it has to, and another millimetre down, blasting where it has to. Raster is rubbish, as you can see. You can get it better than that, but it's hard work. You have, I've yet to play with it. Some people use raster because you use raster for making printed circuit boards. The two ways of making a printed circuit board are isolation milling, where you simply draw round about the tracks and leave all that unused copper, all the copper that you aren't really interested in on the printed circuit board gets left there or there's real removal milling, whereby you take away all the copper that you don't want. If you're working at high frequencies, or you're working with certain types of earth circuits, sometimes you need to remove all that copper. And if you want to remove all that copper, then the raster technique here lets you take away all that copper if you use it. I should say that when you're taking using the laser, to draw printed circuit surfaces. There's about four different ways you can do it. You can turn the laser down low. I like the laser turned down low because I'm scared of it. And use it as a photo source to actually photo etch photo resistant boards. Or you can put the same photo resistant board, but just don't peel the black plastic off it. And use a laser to blast the black plastic off it and then uh, dip it in ferric chloride and, and away you go as before. Or you can take plain copper board and give it a wee coat, a fine, fine coat of black acrylic paint. Blast it with a laser. The laser destroys the paint, stops the, the, the paint from sticking where you blast it. You wipe it off with a toothbrush, dip it in ferric chloride. Or, and I have never tried this, you turn the laser up to 11 and blast away the copper. I'm scared of that. I don't want to start a fire in my house. Because when you put the laser onto the copper, it'll reflect all over the place. It'll be like a disco in the back shed. And it'll be a disco that's destroying things and I don't want it. I'm scared of it. 
I haven't tried it. I would have to build a big wooden box to go over the beast, and um, life's too short and brutal as it is for me to be doing that. And knowing my luck, it would probably end up smelling a chicken. If you've made a printed circuit board, you can turn it over and use the laser to do that. That's not a silk screen, that's black. That's a piece of ordinary single-sided board, and the top surface of the board has been blasted with a laser, simply to tell me where to put the transistors and all pumps and the motor connectors and the earths and, and all that good stuff. <coughs> There's the pen holder that I put up on the 3D print of the month. You can see it's two little pieces of smooth rod with two eight millimeter linear bearings that support a, a wee carriage and the wee carriage carries the pen. There's a wee spring at the back of the carriage pulling the carriage down the way so that when the pen hits the surface, it gets pushed up. So it doesn't try to drive the pen through the paper. This lets me draw things if I want to draw something using this machine as a great big expensive plotter. Or if I'm going to use the laser to do something, I can put the pen in instead of the laser and see what I'm going to get, where it's going to put it, make sure things are positioned right. So putting that on and running it is, is very a very useful wee tool. There it is in position, about to draw a printed circuit board. If I use it with a black permanent marker like that on plain, polished printed circuit board, then I can simply drop that in ferric chloride and etch it, and I've got a PCB in half an hour. Okay, it's not going to be great for SMDs, it's not going to be great for a lot of stuff, but it is doable. And for a lot of stuff we're doing for Merg, eh, it's all through hole plated, eh, dip 8s and dip 14s and resistors and transistors, eminently suitable for that. Software. As I say, I'm using it principally for printed circuit board software. Ego, KiCad, Sprint, Design Spark, all of them, they all have an output that will output either G-code or HPGL or whatever. Anything that you can get out of this will drive that machine. Inkscape is a drawing program, a vector drawing program that is brilliant for lots and lots and lots of things. I'll talk more about Inkscape as we go on. FreeCAD is the de facto standard for doing CAD drawings nowadays. FreeCAD has got, I think it's 12 workbenches that will take in an OpenSCAD drawing. So for example, I use OpenSCAD a lot for designing stuff for the 3D printer. But OpenSCAD, it's really hard to do fillets and chamfers and little bits of drawing that anybody that's done any real engineering drawing knows about fillets and chamfers and uh, all the wee bits that you do to tidy up a drawing and tidy up a part and make it easier to easier to machine and easier to handle. OpenSCAD doesn't do them but FreeCAD does. So I can draw it in OpenSCAD to get the part that I want, import it to FreeCAD and simply say fill it that, fill it that, chamfers there, there, there and there and rebate all those holes, and it'll do all that stuff instantly. So FreeCAD's brilliant. And all of these other open uh, CAM, and it's, CAM and it's a computer-aided manufacturing, and that's basically getting it from a drawing package or a CAD package to manufacture and getting it to via gerbils or via STL or whatever to G-code, because G-code is what you use for any industrial machine that's got a motion controller on it. For operating the machine, now that I don't have the ac access to my Chinese version of Mach 3 anymore, I have to actually move the machine. Now my wee controller will let me jog it up and down, but if I've got a PC connected to it, I can use that UGS thing that I showed you earlier. Pronter face, Repetier host, those are the typical pieces of software that you use for driving a 3D printer. Plug this in and it doesn't know that it's not a 3D printer. You can use it, use the 3D printer software to move the head round about, to make it home, to make it go to its limits. You can do all that good stuff. Candle is 
the similar piece of software for driving a laser cutter that comes with all the, the cheap and nasty Chinese laser cutters that you buy, and it'll work this as well. OEM, I've got my own software. OEM stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer. That's me. I've written scripts in Python, in PowerShell, in C++, in C Sharp, and all sorts of things over the years for this. One of the things that I do to get a really, really good printed circuit board, you want it to be accurate to within half a thou all over the layer of the board. So what I do is write, I've written a piece of software, a piece of code that I put into the PC, I connect the PC to the machine and run it. And the PC then drives the probe all over the board and stops every centimetre over the board. And at that point, it measures the exact height of the Z of where the board is at that point. And it turns out the board's three, three thou high there and two thou low there and a, a thou high in the middle. And, and you get this map of where the, the board is out of shape. The software then uses that information to correct all the Z settings in my, my actual print G code so that when the G-code prints, it prints to where the board is, not where the G-code's telling it. So instead of going to G-code minus 0 0.5 all the way around, it's going to plus 3 at that end of the board, and it's going to minus 1.7 at that end of the board, because it happens to know that that's where the board lives. And so it always touches the board to the right depth. Right? You can build your own software for this. All you're doing is writing text to an RS-232 port and getting text back for an RS-232 port. So if you can write code or you can write uh, scripts, you can do your own stuff, but there's a wealth of pre-written stuff. Very, very unusual to find something that you can think of nowadays that hasn't already been done for this. Software, this is Inkscape. When you open Inkscape, Inkscape's written in Python. It's a brilliant drawing tool. <clears throat> Among the things that I'm not going to talk about, but I have used and you have seen, is when it says above the, the item that's highlighted there on the, uh, the menu, it says FSM MLK. That's the Martin Luther King menu. Um, no, in there, there's a thing for drawing schematic diagrams, transistors and op amps and resistors and diodes to production standard. It really is gorgeous. You know, whatever you want to do drawing-wise on a computer, I recommend Inkscape. If you, you download Inkscape, it doesn't cost you anything. And when you download it and load it, loaded already, you'll find an extension called G-Code Tools. And Jim's going to talk about the detail of how we do that. But it's already built in there. You don't need to buy, install, set up anything. It's already ready to roll there. That one there, I did have to add, that's the photonics. Remember the aircraft that was drawn in straight lines, vectors? That's the vector laser tool. What happens, these extensions, by the way, you download them, they're a zip file. You download the zip file, you unzip it, and then you drop it into a directory called extensions. And that's it installed, that's it done, you're finished. Next time you open up Inkscape, you've got it. You don't have to do any clever setting up or anything. So that's the thing for doing the raster diagrams in, on the laser. And up at the top, that one there's the raster generator for doing the, remember the kind of scabby looking aircraft with the, the, the raster. The raster's great if you want to take photographs. If you want to put your, a photograph of your loved one onto a piece of plastic or something, great for that. Bit pants for everything else that I want to do. piece of software. Um, a few years ago, Eagle was bought over by, Eagle was originally a German company and then it was bought by another company and then it was bought by Farnell and then it was bought out by, it ended up in the hands of AutoCAD. 
And since then, AutoCAD are doing the AutoCAD thing of you don't actually own your data anymore. You don't own the software anymore. You log into our website and everything gets done there and all your files exist on our website. I'm not having that. So I'm still using Eagle version 7.6, which is from, I don't know, 2005 or something now. But it does everything I want to do. And it's got a CNC output for PCB milling. And it's a very, very accurate, very, very nice piece of software for generating that. And at that point, I think I'm done. You need a rest for me and my throat's starting to give out. So Jim will take over now and tell you about his experience with it. Afternoon, everybody. I'd thought about getting a CNC cutter. I looked at them on eBay. <coughs> I didn't know much about them, and I visited a WASAG member and asked if he knew anything about it. He says, well, hold on, I'll just go to the, the, can the TARDIS. So back from the TARDIS, gave me a demo, and I was hooked on it right away, and eBay quickly relieved me of my cash. That The router there was supplied in kit form, and that's it built up there. It was fine, plenty instructions, easy enough to uh, fit together, albeit it was written in Chinese. But if you go into eBay, you'll get videos that shows you how to fit that exactly. The assembly is quite straightforward, although care must be taken, lining up the top and the bottom, the rods, and also applies to the threaded rods. Before you leave that one, Jim, that controller has already got the gerbil built in and the, uh, the, the, the card to put in and all that good stuff, so you don't need any other equipment. No, that's right. Now the kit comes with, with, with uh, one motor, although it shows two there. comes with, with one motor, but you can attach a laser if required. That's the engraving bits. They're pointed, um, and the thing is, if you start to go too far, it opens up the track that you're going to cut. Now, that's the cutter bits. Get them in different sizes. What I use is the one, the 0.5 millimeter, um, and that's a nice fine drill uh, cutter. Um, but what you've got to do is go down in stages, like half a millimetre, a millimetre, and take it. Take your time going down, and the bits will last you for quite a wee while. Now, this is it, the, the part here, the railway modeler. That was July 7, 1978, but I didn't get it in July 1978, because I was too young then. <laughs> The modeler um, was one of the guys in the Air Model Railway Club. And I'd asked about anybody knew where you could get Scottish outline buildings. And he said, well, I've got a, a, a modeler and I'll bring it in. So he brought me in the modeler. Now, that's the, the inside the modeler. It's tenement buildings and it was done by Douglas Boyle, who happens to be a, a member of WASAG. That was not known to me at the time, nor was was I. Now, the top is at the old style tenements. The, the middle one was a picture that he'd done of Woolworths. The bottom one is the model that was done in Inkscape. Now, that's the the model that's in, inside the model, the diagram that's inside the railway modeler, giving you all the sizes. Now, what you do, you take the sizes and trans, transfer that. That's it in the Inkscape. That's the sizes taken from the railway modeler and fitted in. Now, this is a, the G code. Now, Chick helped me with the G-code. My brain's still nipping. So, 
once once you get the, the hang of it, it's it's quite easy. Well, no easy, but it's a, a lot easier. First, you'll go object to path, as you see in the top there. Then you get that green box coming up. And within the green box, you've got the diameter, the cutters, the depth step. You change that to what you would require. And the type of the cutter we've got is a cylinder. Then we go to orientation points, and that will give you a line along the bottom. You see just down at the bottom there, like the three zeros, it's covered by the end there, but that comes up on whatever you've designed. Now, next, you, you take preferences, pick on preferences, and that will be like output NGC. You make sure you put that uh, suffix in. Now, this is the G code. Now, that G code <laughs> looks quite daunting, and it is initially. Now, check help me no ends with that. Now, there, I don't know how the screens are, but it starts off Z0, and you're going down 125 millimetres. Now, you can change that as you go along for different cuts. You could have it 0.5 a millimetre, a millimetre, 2.5, 3, whatever, taking it down in steps. Now, this is my hurdy gurdy, <laughs> the CNC cutter. Now, you'll notice that uh, mine's is kind of sparse of uh, sheet metal. Now, that's mine's, mine's wasn't, wasn't too dear, it'd be around about 200 pounds, I think. Now, it's quite easy, as I said, to assemble. Um, the main thing is you watch out for the sizes and make sure that everything's level and um, it's going to run smooth. Now, on the top there, that's a sacrificial board. Now, that fits in. That fits onto the board and there's bolts come th through there with clasps on that you can set along the, the, the sides there and that holds it. Now, if you've set the, the cutter wrong for any, any reason, maybe uh, you went to go 1.5 millimetres and you went to 2 millimetres, it would be cutting the, the board itself, the machine itself. So that it takes the, the hard take out the, the, the drill going through into the base. And at that point, we've got a little video to show you, so I'm going to unshare my screen and let Davy show us the vid. Now that's plastic on the front and cardboard, sorry, come up there. Plastic on the front, get that better. Plastic on the front and cardboard on the side. Different sizes, three millimeter on the plastic and two millimeter on the cardboard. 